good. And um, thanks for coming along today. Um, uh, yeah, in case you don't know, what I'm mainly going to be talking about today is global supply chains. And in particular, a trip I did two summers ago with Unknown Fields. Um, I'm going to talk for about 40 minutes, I think. And I think more than that would probably be a bit too much. And I'm going to show you a lot of photos and videos. So I'm sorry if it starts to feel a little bit like I'm showing you my vacation photos, because uh, in a way I am. Um, but hopefully there'll be a point to it at the end. So some of you might have heard of Unknown Fields. If not, it's run by Liam Young, who's the person that organized the terrible bus journey. It wasn't terrible if he's watching. Um, <laughs> the very long bus journey that me and Ingrid met on. Uh, run by Liam, and Liam Young and Kate Davis, who referred to the project as a nomadic design studio. Um, they're speculative architects and researchers based out of the Architecture Association in London. And every year they take groups of students, artists, filmmakers, and journalists on field trips to see infrastructure and spaces that are largely hidden. So in the past, they've been to the ruins of Chernobyl. Uh, they recently went to, clothes man see, to look at clothes manufacturing in Bangladesh um, and the lithium mines in Bolivia, amongst many other places. They've been doing this for about 10 years now. The point of this particular trip in 2014 was meant to be pretty straightforward. Over three weeks, we were trekked back up the supply chain for consumer goods from China, stopping at factories and markets along the way until we ended up at the rare earth mines of Inner Mongolia. In effect, we wanted to follow the path in reverse that a lot of our everyday items take to get to us, right back to the point where the raw materials are dug out of the ground. Uh, but long before that, we started off uh, by spending a week on a container ship traveling between some of the megaports of the South China Sea. Our group has split up across various ships, and this here on the right here is the ship that I was on, the Maersk Selator, a 1,000 foot long, 80,000 ton, 9,000 container capacity ship. It was my home for seven days. Um, it's another shot of the This is me there at the end. And Dan Williams as well. <laughs> yeah. like people might know Dan. But yeah. um, now, if I ask you to same name some multinational corporate brands, you could probably reel off half a dozen off the top of your head from Apple to Coca-Cola to whatever. But chances are that Maersk wouldn't spring to mind. Yet the Danish shipping giant is the very definition of a multinational corporation. With over 25,000 employees, 345 offices in 125 countries, 600 active ships, and more than 2 million containers moved every year. The company is estimated to be responsible for 20% of Denmark's GDP just on its own. Maersk might not make any of the things you buy in stores, but it more than likely put a lot of them there. Now, when I talk about megaports in Asia, it's incredibly hard to communicate the size and scale of how big these places are. I know I certainly wasn't prepared for it until we arrived at our departure port in Busan uh, in South Korea. It's been over 45 years since the Apollo moon landings, and some people like to say that we don't build big anymore, that we've become too fascinated with the small, too impressed by our tablets, our games consoles, and our smartphones that we don't invest in grand, world-changing engineering projects. But when you stand on the bridge of a container ship docked in a megaport, however, it's clear that's just not true. The global supply chain that brings us those tablets and phones and pretty much everything else from our clothes and food to our toys and souvenirs is nothing short of a moonshot itself, a vast, unprecedented engineering solution to a truly astronomical logistics problem. The fact that it's hidden from most people's sight and that it's become so utterly reliable and efficient to the point of transparency doesn't make it any less an achievement of human technical endeavor. Now, I could go into a lot of detail explaining how these seat-sized ports run, uh, but that would take up a whole talk on its own. So hopefully this video I shot um, at the first port we stopped at uh, will give you an idea of what the day-to-day -day cargo moving process looks like. I'll just let this one out for a bit and you can watch it. Um, this is obviously shot from on the ship, looking down into the hold. Um, and, like Boxes have been taken off and put on. And these blue structures are obviously the, um, 
the Super Panamax cranes, which are the, the world's largest cranes, and they're kind of standard in most ports now. <coughs> Suffice to say, it's a constant, never-ending choreographed ballet of huge cranes, slightly less huge cranes, and trucks, all choreographed very precisely, much more precisely than any human could. And it's never-ending. Whenever a ship arrives in port, regardless of what time of day or night, the second it's safely tied, tied up, this process starts instantly. At least for now, this is, and this is already starting to change, these cranes and trucks are still driven by humans. But they're receiving their instructions, which anonymous box to pick up next, where exactly to have your truck waiting so a box can be dropped on it, from computers. More precisely, from network devices they carry with them that tell them exactly what to do next. I didn't get a photo of one of these, unfortunately. Um, they carry a device which looks a little bit, in most reports anyway, they carry a device that looks a little bit like a, uh, an old-fashioned radio or get a blast or something, but it's got a big LED screen on it. And they put that in the cab of their truck, and I, belie and I believe in the cranes, they put them in the cab of the cranes, so they might be built into the cranes. And it flashes up numbers, which they understand is where they have to drive to next, which box they're picking up next, where they have to be, um, so these boxes are dropped onto them. So you, when, the, when the ship comes into port, as soon as, like I say, as soon as it's tied up, the cranes start loading them off. And as soon as, the, as, as you're tied up, there's already a stream of these flatbed trucks waiting, um, all queued up, boxes dropped on them instantly, and then they take them into the stacks where they're stored uh, until they're, they're, they're ferried out of the port to whatever their end destination is. And obviously the same things happen in, res in reverse. Mainly in China it's happening in reverse. You're mainly seeing things being put on the ship rather than things coming off. It's the kind of logistical information that's hard to imagine any one, mind, one human mind comprehending, and the truth is no single one does. This is distributed knowledge, managed by Merck's vast world-spanning computer network and shaped and interpreted by complex, similarly unknowable algorithms. In a very real sense, the crane and truck drivers are little more than elements in a vast robotic system, receiving instructions in their cabs from their computerized managers, following orders on endless cycles until their shift ends. Not that there isn't a certain amount of pride in their work, as regimented and alienating as it might seem. It's not unusual to see the cranes decorated with awards and badges, announcing record-breaking container shift, sh shifting performances. At the same time, it's, not impossible, it's also impossible not to be struck by the, precarious of the precariousness of their job security. With so much managed by the network, it must surely only be a matter of time before the system evolves enough to remove the human element entirely. In fact, ports like Rotterdam and the Netherlands have already moved to fully automated systems with driverless trucks and robotic cranes. So this is uh, one of the, this is taken from on the ship, uh, and this is one of the, the cranes tracking across, which is kind of like, was incredibly, the size of these things is, is really hard to explain. It's incredibly like, uh, kind of science fictional experience. And you can see a little bit of the size of the scale of the port here as well. Like the other side, uh, the shots across the water, you can see that there's exactly the same infrastructure exists on the other side. And like I say, this runs 24-7. Um, We'd quite often get into port at like three in the morning and this would start instantly. There would be trucks queued up waiting for the containers as soon as we arrived. And of course, I'll talk about this a little bit more. Um, nobody knows what's in these containers is the other thing. Nobody in the, driving the trucks, nobody driving the cranes. With a few exceptions, nobody on the ship knows what's in these containers. Only the algorithms really know, what, know what's in the containers. And this is us leaving. This is the captain and the pilot. Um, this is just us pulling out after we finally loaded up at the first port in South Korea. And you can kind of see there's just like these ships. There's another ship the same as ours. There's another one the same size behind it, just stacked up. Largely, these vast, these vast spaces are hugely generic and look pretty much the same. They need to be. Everything has to be incredibly standardized to make sure it all fits together with utmost efficiency. There's little room for local flavor in the precise machinery of globalization. 
There are exceptions, though. The containers are constantly shuffled around the yard, depending on what the algorithms decide is the most efficient place for them to be. And usually, this is done by rail-mounted cranes. But in Kaohsiung Port in Taiwan, we saw these. Uh, these weird, robotic-looking mobile cranes that seem to buzz around on massive moon, buggies, moon buggy wheels. Um, they look exactly like something you'd see in a grimy science fiction movie. I just spent all day <laughs> like watching these things drive around, because they look like something from a Neil Blomkamp film or something. They're just, they're just like, kind of crazy. And they use these instead of cranes and trucks there. And they're still driven. They're, they're not automated. There's a little guy sat at the top there, which just looks terrifying, because they look really top heavy. And but they go around, and, and they can pick up these, these, the boxes. And then you can see they're, they're, hi they're higher than the stack of three. So you can slip over the stack and drop them on top. And they drive them really fast. I think I've got some footage. It looks like they're racing them or something. It just looks like some kind of weird dystopian Mad Max thing. <laughs> like when they haven't got a container in them, they look really like they're going to fall over. Because they just still like, they can't work out where their they're center of balance is. They're, yeah, just crazy. Anyway, enough. Sorry, I can just watch that all day. <laughs> so yeah, they look like something you'd see in a science fiction movie, but then, to be honest, pretty much everything you see in these ports looks exactly like something you'd see in a grimy science fiction movie. At night, and I apologize for the quality of the photo because it's hard to shoot, but um, this is one of Liam's, actually, but um, everything just is like this weird Blade Runner-style <coughs> landscape at night because everything's running 24 hours, so everything's lit up. I'd love to talk to you more about the crew of the ship and the details of their lives at sea, but again, that would need another talk all to itself. I'll say this, the myth of the seafarer as some kind of globe-trotting adventurer couldn't be further from the truth. With shore leave a rarity and ports so far from urban centers that, they leave excurs that day leave excursions become little more than trips to out-of-town shopping malls to stock up essentials such as shampoo, shower gel, and snacks. But for most of Celtar's crew, made up of mainly Indian, Filipino, and Chinese se seafarers, the reasons for going to the sea is the same as they ever were, to make money that would be sent home to their wives, children, and parents. But even at the distance from their families, it feels like it has shrunk, thanks to Celtar's satellite internet access. It's slow and patchy, but it's enough for the crew to maintain daily communication with home, with most of them spending a sizable chunk of their time crouching in corridors and stairwells with smartphones and laptops, trying to find an elusive Wi-Fi signal so they can talk to home, send messages to loved ones, and connect to Facebook. This is a very common site, and I ended up doing this myself after a couple of days. I'd kind of done that, that, um, that very kind of like Western New York thing, oh, I'm going to be on a ship for five days, I'm not going to be on the internet, it'll be amazing. Like I can t cut off on social media completely, I can get some work done. I did get some work done. But then you, you're, you're there and you realize that the ship's just part of a network in its, uh, its own way and everybody else is in the corridors, because there were certain corridors where the Wi-Fi signal was better, just like sitting there constantly outside my cabin, like trying to get on Facebook. The big eye-opener for me, though, was learning why the satellite internet had been installed on Merck's ships in the first place. It's not actually there for humans to use. It's there for the containers. Well, some of the containers, at least, specifically the refrigerated ones, known in the industry as reefers. Reefers are containers outfitted to be advanced, climate-controlled, computer-monitored microenvironments, plumbed directly into the ship's power supply. Used to move everything from food to pharmaceuticals, the reefers on the cargo ship I rode were mainly carrying fish meal, processed fish guts used for fertilization and feeding cattle, exported from Chile and headed to China, one of the few items to flow that direction through the supply chain in large quantities. Like I say, this is a reefer. You can see it's like this kind of like touchscreen control panel at the back. And these are like, they're really advanced. Um, they're quite often used to move fruit, is the main thing they used to move. But they, what they'll do is they'll put fruit in it as soon as they can, as soon as it's been picked, and then it will be... The container knows where it's going and how long it takes to get there, and during that time, it will alter the temperature so the fruit w ripens. So when, it when that container turns up at a supermarket, like your bananas or whatever are ready to be eaten or ready to be sat on the shelves for a few days. Um, they're, quite, they're quite insane pieces of technology. And, and well, uh, let me explain. 
The reefers highlight the changing role of, of the human crew in what is an increasingly automated system. Unlike the other containers on the ship, which are little more, little more than anonymous boxes to humanize, the con their contents on origins and destinations unknown, the reefers presented one of the few direct responsibilities the crew had for looking after their cargo. It was the cr crew's d duty to ensure they constantly had power when maintaining the right temperature and to repair them if they malfunctioned. But even then, the crew's relationship to the reefers was heavily mediated by technology. Not only are the reefers smart enough to know when something has gone wrong, but they're picky about who they tell when it does. Connected directly to Musk's global network, when something fails, they don't tell the crew directly, but instead call home, thousands of miles back to the, computers, the company's computers in Denmark, who had then relayed a message to the ship's captain, who then tells the crew what to do. These containers, containers seem to have more agency and decision-making process than the humans on the ship. Something starkly illustrated by how painfully slow internet access was out at sea. The crew patiently used the sluggish internet to check their email, update Facebook, keep in touch with their families, etc., while away at sea for months, piggybacking off the reefer network, a tiny, almost token, sliver of the machine's precious bandwidth given over to human use. One day I stood on the bridge chatting to the ship's captain when we were interrupted by a buzzing sound. He walked over to a nearby computer. I asked him what was up. He said, ah, it's nothing, just an email from Maersk telling me to slow down. Why, I asked him. I don't know, they never tell me, he shrugged. Probably means there's delays at the next port, no need to waste fuel by going too fast. This turned out to be a daily occurrence. Maersk regularly sent him and his senior officers messages informing him of course changes or telling him what speed to take. Even the captain has become just another node in the network, the day-to-day -day running of his ship dedicated, dictated by the unseen al algorithms. Okay, so eventually we had to leave the ship and start our, China, ch our uh, journey across China by land after reaching port of Yanshan, and our first stop was Shenzhen. Now, again, I could fill another talk just on Shenzhen, and I'm sure the city is probably familiar to a lot of you. Um, is of course known as the home of China's largest concentration of electronics manufacturing. Shenzhen was recently declared China's third largest city after Shanghai and Beijing. But before it was given special economic zone status in 1979, Shenzhen was just a, a fishing port with a population of 300,000. Now it's home to over 15 million, almost twice the population of MIC, and it continues to swell, constantly drawing workers from China's countryside the children of subsistence farmers hoping to carve out a better life for themselves in the city. Mention Shenzhen to most people and they'll probably think of the vast Foxconn manufacturing plant that churns out high-end phones, tablets, laptops and gaming consoles for the likes of Apple, Microsoft, Dell and Sony. The size of a small city with an estimated half a million employees, Foxconn Shenzhen plant might be the biggest and best known, but Foxconn is only one of several hundred factories in and around Shenzhen. In fact, the megacity is responsible for producing an estimated 90% of the world's consumer electronics, the vast, vast majority of which are far less glamorous than iPhones and Playstations. Now, due to our time schedule, we only got a couple of days in Shenzhen, and in that time we got to visit two factories, but they were both very different. The first of these was TCL LCD Industrial Park. It's a fraction of the size of Foxconn, but it's still industrial manufacturing on a scale that's become alien to most of us in the West. This one facility has an incredible 10,000 employees, with 3,000 of them living in on-site dormitories. TCL is perhaps best known in the US as a manufacturer of popular Roku streaming media players, but the company also makes 18 million TVs a year, as well as refrigerators, washers, dryers, air conditioners, Blu-ray players, all labelled under a number of different brands. Here at LCD Industrial Park, they mainly assemble, t assemble TVs at a rate of 160 an hour from components made in the Shenzhen factories. Unfortunately, they were incredibly strict at TCL about photography. We weren't allowed to take pictures of film or production lines at all. This is some footage I managed to sneak on my phone. Um, from what we did see, it was hard to really understand what's going on. The production line seemed semi-automated. In, in amongst the robotic machinery, young workers somewhere in t-shirts with QR codes on their backs. Futuristic vertical conveyor belts lifted TV panels from some unseen space beneath the floor. It's clean, it's well lit, and the ceilings are high. The workers here are given at least two months training before they start, depending on where they're placed. They work a minimum of one eight-hour shift a day. We can do a second if they want. I was assured this is optional, for six days a week. 
In return, they get paid, on average, about 3,000 won, or roughly $484 a month. While we were there, we did get to have lunch in one of the factory's free canteens, a uh, huge three-level free level food court type complex. Each of these three canteens served 3,000 workers a day. Watched over by CCTV cameras, hordes of teenage employees in short sleeve uniforms, colored coded depending on which line they work, sit at fast food restaurant style tables, eating meat and rice and drinking garishly artificial looking fruit juices. Everyone is over 16, many appear in their early 20s, but it's hard not to think of a busy high school cafeteria as they talk, laugh and gossip. But this isn't a school. Most of these kids have had basic minimal educations before they arrive. This is the powerhouse behind China's economic boom, the workforce that keeps the, factories, the world's factory floor running. Just as not all factories in Shenzhen are like Foxconn, neither are they all like TCL. For every plant on the scale of LCD industrial, there are dozens of smaller operations in Shenzhen, grimy little startup factories tucked away in rundown warehouses or suburban trading estates. Shenzhen UA Information and Technology Development Company Limited is one of these, a small factory of less than 200 workers that specializes in making GPS tracking devices for motor vehicles. Its main products are modules the size of car stereos that fit into bus dashboards. Com by combining feeds and CCTV cameras and sensors with GPS data, they can be used to retrofit existing public transport vehicles for the glorious new smart city era. It's incredibly hot on the EU production line, despite the efforts of the industrial scale AC units to fill the room with cold, mildew-scented air. It was dark, too, compared to TCL. The workers here, most of them again look like teenagers, sit in rows along slowly moving conveyor belts. They all wear matching blue shirts, their faces pale and washed out by fluorescent, fluorescent strip lighting that hangs above their workstations. They mainly seem to be testing components and products silently taking electronics from the belt as they pass by and plugging them into equipment on their desk to make sure the connections work. Function units go back in the belt to be tested again further up the line and faulty ones are put in plastic crates on the floor. The work looks monotonous, the atmosphere feels oppressive, the air thick with the smell of sweat and solder. Here two workers log one or two eight hour shifts a day, but the pay is even low, lower. Most make just around $323 a month. Yue is one of those factories, and Shenzhen is full of them that specialize in components rather than finished consumer products, the kind of cheap components that keep the maker scene here in the West viable. There's a certain belief within the international maker community that its homebrew DIY approach to electronics offers, offers a more ethical alternative to the larger manufacturers such as Apple or Samsung. But the uncomfortable truth is that the real cost of the cheap components they rely upon is noticeably worse working conditions not to mention lower pay than in big brand factories. At 5 p.m. a bell sounds and the conveyor belts grind to a halt. Dinner break. The workers form orderly single file lines, waiting for managers to tell them they can leave. As they exit, they each pass through metal detectors, pausing to have their faces scanned by a facial, re facial recognition system mounted next to the door. Only when it beeps its approval can they leave. I didn't really get, because they wouldn't tell me, to the bottom of what this was about, but everybody had to have their face scanned as they were leaving. I don't know how, my gut reaction is that the people that run the factory probably got sold this technology by someone in a different factory and said you should use it, because I don't really see the point for it, but it just had this kind of really dystopic element to, to everything again. We followed them out, walking between the backs of the towering warehouse buildings, studded of industrial piping and exhaust vents. The canteen here is a far cry from TCL's multi-level facilities. It's another dingy space filled with wooden tables and benches, paint peeling from the walls. Just two minutes' walk from the factory floor is where the majority of UE's workers live, in four-story concrete housing blocks is reminiscent of brut brutalist municipal projects in the US or Europe. Inside the rooms are largely features apart from basic metal, metal frame bunk beds. It's obviously a room that wasn't being used, I hope, uh, that we got into. Uh, we got, I went into another couple of rooms where there were people living in there, and they weren't, to be honest, much different from this. Uh, there wasn't much on the walls, they were fairly bare. Well, guys were sitting around playing like World of Warcraft and stuff. Like I said, there's a lot to be discussed about Shenzhen, especially in relation to its future, the rising cost of living, 
automation, etc. And I'm happy to answer questions as best I can about it afterwards. But for now, let's push on. In fact, I'm going to skip forward uh, to quite later in the trip when we arrived at a much lesser known city, Yiwu. Yiwu is infamous for two things, really. And the first is Yiwu International Trade Market. It's hard to know how to describe Yiwu market scale. I could start with stats, how it currently covers an area of 4 million square meters, 62,000 booths inside. I could tell you how it's estimated to have an incredible 40,000 visitors every day, 5,000 of whom are said to be buyers from foreign countries. But these are just numbers. Inside, it looks like a large, run-down shopping mall. But you need to start walking to appreciate the size. The complex is divided into five districts, and I first entered through District 1, straight into a corridor lined with shops exhibiting only pens and pencils. I turn a corner, more pens and pencils. I walk for about 15 minutes. All I see are the same pens and pencils. Eventually, I reach a broken escalator changing levels. Pens and pencils give way to countless corridors full of shops selling glasses cases. Another level change, and it's a whole sub-district that's dedicated to artificial flowers. It's not just the size that separates you in market from your local shopping mall. For a start, you can't really buy anything here, at least not in the conventional consumer sense. You in market is, for the large part, strictly wholesale. Each of the 62,000 booths, all identically sized 2.5 by 2.5 meter cubes, is a showroom for an individual company or factory. The market is less a shopping mall than a vast, endless trade show, built for those, those most important of middlemen, retail buyers who flock here from across China and the rest of the world to negotiate deals on, shopping, on shipping containers full of cheap products to fill the shelves of stores back home. The sheer scale of all this belies the fact that EU market's heyday is pretty much in the past now. Much of this trade is now migrating online to websites such as Alibaba and Made in China, as well as being done increasingly by retail management algorithms that were replacing human buyers. But it still remains the physical manifestation of the vast invisible network that supplies many of the inexpensive goods we all buy in the West and worldwide. As impossibly varied as it all seems, everything here has something in common. There are no high-value goods here in the Yiwu market, and few branded items. You can search all day in the electronics district, and you'll see nothing by Samsung, Apple, or Beats. Instead, you'll see a very large and often overlooked sector of China's manufacturing output. It's the little items that fill your desk drawers, the free pens that salesmen give you, and the toys your children break and forget. It's the hundreds of disposable products that fill dollar stores and gas stations. It's the stuff you buy on impulse, or because it's momentarily funny, and all because it's cheap. China is the global leading, leader in creating plastic junk, and Yi Wu Market is its showroom. And a lot of people are sleeping now. Because, like I say, the, the, the market's very much on a decline. Uh, people are doing all this stuff online, or it's been done semi-automated now. Uh, and as vast as it is, there just wasn't that many people in there when I was there. The figures we were told about visitors, I think, were probably like, largely out of date. Uh, so people seem to just be sleeping, waiting for people to turn up. The other thing Yiwu is famous for is Christmas. According to the state-run Chinese news agency, more than 60% of the world's Christmas decorations are made in Yiwu. In 2012, Yiwu and the surrounding region had an estimated 750 companies making Christmas decorations and other festive items. We got to visit one of them, Yiwu Hangshen Arts and Crafts Co. Limited, a small company about 30 minutes' drive outside the city. It would prove to be one of the most bewildering and unsettling factories we'd visit in China. I'll just let this play out for a bit, because it probably does a better job of conveying what the factory is like than me talking, to be honest. I'll say one thing, the scale of the manual labor that was involved really surprised me. Perhaps I was naive, but if you'd asked me before I visited you how Christmas decorations were made, I'd have guessed they were mass-producing largely automated factories. But the truth is actually the real secret of China's manufacturing success. Keeping local costs, keeping labor costs sorry, so low that making things by hand is cheaper than using machines. I was never given a definite figure, but I'm told by one of the factory managers that employees here are paid somewhere between $200 and $300 a month to work 12-hour-plus shifts, six days a week. It allows small companies like Yiwu to get started with relatively little investment, 
while giving them the flexibility to adapt and change what they produce to fit their, their customers' needs. It was early August when we got to, um, we got to this factory and they were making Christmas decorations. They were about to stop making Christmas decorations and they were about to start making Halloween decorations and then after that, Valentine's Day decorations. So the point is if they, if they were using machines to mass produce this stuff, they'd have between every type of different product they were making, they would have a huge amount of re-logistics, reprogramming, maybe even buy new equipment to fit, to fit the products they wanted to make. Whereas this was just a minimal amount of retraining for, for, the, for the workers here. Also meant they, could, they were looking at what was popular and what was selling and making that rather than making something and then trying to sell it. So they, the Chinese uh, manufacturing model is very reactive in that sense. And the fact this is a city that just makes Christmas decorations isn't that unusual. It's very much part of the Chinese economic philosophy, what they call the specialized city system, where they will, literally the government will look at the global consumer market and see that there's increased demand for umbrellas. So they will build a new city from scratch, move people into it from the surrounding countryside, and get those people to just make umbrellas. There's cities that just make umbrellas, there's cities that just make uh, trash bags, there are cities that just make socks. We like to think about manufacturing China as being iPhones, but they make a lot more. Which is, I think, and maybe we can talk about this a little bit after, it's tied very much into what we're hearing about automation in China and why I'm slightly skeptical about some of the claims that are being made. It was just very weird being, it was like 80 degrees out and we're st <laughs> like, in, it's August and we're st just surrounded by Christmas stuff. It was very weird. I mean, they're literally assembling this stuff by hand, like with glue guns and stuff. It's all come out of injection molding, which you'll see in a bit, and then there's someone else just like sticking stuff together. And they've, they've got crates that are towering above them of stuff they made. And I literally, again, like maybe I was naive, but I literally believed this was done on, on like semi-automated production lines. I thought all this sort of plastic crap was made in big factories with robots, like kind of almost pressing this stuff out, you know? Uh, but no, it's 750 factories like this in Yiru of people making this stuff by hand. It's basically artisan, right? It's Brooklyn artisan. It's been assembled by hand. And the level upstairs uh, was all sewing machine operators. And they were making mainly hats. You know those red and white Santa hats everybody wears? Um, what's that Santa Day thing they have here? SantaCon. Santa That's it, thank you. That's, this lady makes those hats for SantaCon people. What was interesting, what the, the people in the factory, one of the things they told me was their biggest export client now, and this has changed a lot, is Russia. It used to be mainly the US and Europe, uh, but Russia is by far their biggest client now for, for Christmas stuff. See, she was just pushing them off the side of the desk and they're just like piling up on the floor. There's quite a lot more of this video. I can skip through it if people are, are like, it just gets depressing after a while watching it, really. Our next stop after Yiwu was our final destination, uh, Batao, the largest industrial city in, in Mongolia. 
It's one of the world's biggest suppliers of rare earth minerals. I'm sure most of you are familiar with what that is, what, what is meant by rare earth, but just quickly, these are the elements that can be found in everything from magnets and wind turbines and electric car motors to the electronic guts of smartphones and flat screen TVs. In 2009, China produced 95% of the world's supply of these elements, and it's estimated that the Bay and Obo mines just north of Batao contain 70% of the world's reserves. And the, those minerals are processed in the Baogang steel and rare earth complex, a huge network of refineries that dominates the horizon wherever you look. Again, I won't say too much about the city itself due to time, but it's a pretty crazy place. At times, it's impossible to tell where the vast structure of the Balgan refineries complex ends and the city begins. Massive pipes erupt from the ground and run along roadways and sidewalks, arcing into the air to cross bridges and like crossroads like bridges. The streets here are wide, built to accommodate the constant stream of huge diesel belching coal trucks that dwarf all other traffic. After it rains, they plow unstoppable through roads flooded with water turned black by coal dust. They line up by the sides of the road, queuing to fill to turn into one of Patel's many coal-burning power stations that sit unsettlingly close to the freshly built apartment towers. Everywhere you look, between the half-completed tower blocks and the hastily thrown up multi-storey parking lots, it's a forest of flame-tipped refinery towers and endless electricity pylons. The air is filled with a constant ambient smell of sulphur. It's the kind of industrial landscape that America and Europe has largely forgotten. At one time, parts of Detroit or Pittsburgh must have looked and smelled very much like this. One of our first visits in the city is to a processing plant that specializes mainly in producing cerium, one of the most abundant rare earth minerals. Cerium has a huge number of commercial applications, from coloring glass to making catalytic converters. The guide who shows us around the plant explains that they mainly produce cerium oxide, used to polish touch screens on s smartphones and tablets. Right, now, so I've, I haven't got very many photos of this because it was really boring. There were lots of centrifuges and chemical plant type equipment. The, the most interesting thing was there was nobody there. The day we went, it was just empty. It was just, just completely empty. And I kept saying to the people who were showing us around, um, and they didn't know I was a journalist, although they kind of suspected me. We were, they wouldn't have let us in if we were journalists, so we were sort of undercover pretending to be geology professors and the students were our, were our field trip. Yeah, I know. Ethics. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> we wouldn't have got... We wouldn't, I'm, not a, I'm not an academic, I don't want... Um, <laughs> I, I've got no IRB for any of this. Um, uh, they were showing us around and there was just nobody there. There was absolutely nobody there. And I kept saying, so where were the staff? Why is the factory not running? And they were like, oh, it's cleaning day. And there was nobody cleaning. And I was like... I, I, Okay, and then if we'd walk around a bit more, and a few minutes later, I said, "So there's nobody cleaning." It's oh, it's maintenance day, you know. Like they just through a translator were kind of brushing me off. Um, and then we left, and one of the guys that, that we were on the trip with, uh, Toby, he'd been before. He was like a, a sort of fixer for us, and he's, and this is theoretical. I've no evidence to back back this up. He, he says they, sh what happens is they get phone calls from the Chinese government. They get phone calls from the Chinese uh, uh, finance, the government's financial ministers and, and tell them to stop manufacturing. Because what they do is the, they are constantly watching the prices of rare earths and they've got such a stranglehold over the price of rare earths. If they see uh, the prices dropping, they will artificially f f rig the market by just stopping manufacturing for like a week or two. And then all the uh, Japan, Korea, pe p places whose industries really depend on these, these minerals the, uh, are so desperate the prices start going up again. I don't know how true that is, but that's what I was told. One of Patel's other main exports is neodymium, which is a word I can never pronounce. Another rare earth for a variety of applications. Again, it is used to dye glass, especially for making lasers, perhaps, but perhaps its most important use is in making powerful yet lightweight magnets. Neodymium magnets are used in consumer electronics items such as in-ear headphones, cell phone microphones, and computer hard drives. Basically, if you've got a magnet on something, it's probably neodymium these days. At the other end of the scale, they're a vital component in large equipment that requires large, powerful magnetic fields, such as wind farm turbines and the motors that power the new generation of electric cars. It's very important to remember, especially with what's coming up, that neodymium is a very important mineral in green technology, is what I'm trying to say here. The intriguing thing about both neodymium and cerium is that they're, they're, while they're called rare earth minerals, they're actually fairly common. 
Neodymium is no rarer than copper or nickel and quite evenly distributed throughout the world's crust. While China produced 90% of the global market's neodymium, only 30% of the world's deposits are located there. Arguably, what makes it and cerium scarce enough to be profitable are the hugely hazardous and toxic processes needed to extract them from ore and to refine them into usable products. For example, cerium is extracted by crushing mineral mixtures and dissolving them in sulfuric and nitric acid. And this has to be done on a huge industrial scale, resulting in a, fast amount, in a vast amount of poisonous waste as a product, as a byproduct. I, I was told that the actual process from ore to cerium oxide is two kilometers long. It's, that's the amount of refining equipment it needs to go through until you get a small amount um, that you can use to polish, like an iPhone screen. It could be argued that China's dominance of the rare earth market is less about geology and far more about the country's willingness to take an environmental hit that other nations shy away from. And we've got an idea of exactly what that environmental hit looks like just a few miles outside of Batao. So this is, I think it's about five miles outside the city limits. This is a tailings pond. It's a five mile wide lake of black, faintly radioactive and barely liquid toxic sludge. It's the byproduct of the incredibly toxic processes needed to refine the small amounts of rare earths that make our modern consumer devices possible. This is, in many ways, the hidden unseen cost of our constant desire for new technology, and especially our need to constantly upgrade our hardware and have the latest gadgets. So you can look this up on, on Google Maps, um, if you know where to look. And you can see these black pipes. You can measure it on Google Maps, and it's, it's about five miles across. All around the coast, there's, you can see on Google Maps these pipes. There are just hundreds of them. And you can kind of see, not so well, but like the whole landscape is just refineries. And this is Liam, and <laughs> he is uh, collecting samples of clay, which was actually, so we could get it tested, but also um, predominantly because he is doing a, he did a really quite nice art project where he took, brought some of these samples of clay back, used them to make uh, clay, and then we, they were used to make pots. And they did pots of various sizes, depending on how much of this waste was created. Uh, they were in Ming Dynasty style pots, uh, depending on the, on, on the item. So there was a small one, which is the amount of waste that's created for uh, a cell phone, a large one for a laptop, and then a very large one, which is for a car battery. It had been a stressful trip, and I was really willing for him to fall in at that point, but I think everybody was. He'll appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what he's like, man. <laughs> I love him, but... So, yeah, this is him triumphant with his, uh, his clay, which then he tried to make us smuggle back in our bags, and we all, I think everybody apart from maybe Dan refused to, and then his, one of, someone's bag with two of these things in disappeared for, like, a week. In the, in, the, in the airport system, in the supply chain, which was kind of exciting. Um, it's hard to see. Oh, yeah, so interestingly, a few months after I got back and I started writing this up for the BBC, the Apple Watch was announced, and I was stuck by how perfectly it summed up our current relationship to technology and the environment. Once we made watches with rare earth minerals mined from the earth and treated them like they were precious heirlooms, handing them down from generation to generation, them gaining in value as they aged. Now we make watches with even rarer minerals, and we'll want to update them constantly, even, even buy a new one every year as the outmoded, outmoded models become valueless. It's hard to see how this can remain sustainable. 
Okay, so that was our trip, and thanks for listening for all that. There's a, just a couple more things I'd like to say before we get to questions. First off, increasingly there seems to be renewed interest in infrastructure, and I think that's great. People think it's cool, and it is cool. Um, it's impossible not to look at container ships and megaports and these huge cranes and not be in awe of the scale of it all. They are literally awesome. I was constantly blown away the whole week I spent on that ship. It was a fantastic experience. But then about two weeks later, when I stood in that Christmas factory in Yiwu, I realized something. That all this stuff, all this cool stuff, it all exists just so that this can exist. This vast globe-spanning feat of engineering, semi-automated and guided by algorithms, exists just so that we can buy Christmas decoration and lots of other disposable plastic trash for cheap. One of the prime reasons it exists is to keep human labor costs low. It exists so that economies of scale mean it's cheaper to make this stuff on the other side of the world than, say, somewhere in New Jersey. It exists so that what are, in fact, hand-painted holly berries only cost you a buck in Target. It's a moonshot-scale engineering project designed to keep labor costs down for half the planet so the other half can buy plastic crap for cheap. And there are also some bigger, weirder, and more global implications that I want to talk about. And forgive me at this point, because this is where I start talking about stuff that I'm still looking into and still researching. This might all seem a little half-baked. As well as algorithmically controlled, an algorithmically controlled network that's moving physical capital around and largely driving and controlling national and global economies on its own, there's this other network that's moving and controlling financial capital. It takes the form of the kind of predictive modeling and trading software that's used on Wall Street. Neither of these are networks that humans are really capable of understanding, let alone controlling, at least not on a global scale. At best, as individuals, we can understand or influence a very small part of them. And this is increasingly true for politicians and world leaders. Like the captain of the container ship or the crane drivers in the ports, politicians have less and less control over how these networks run. Instead, they are just managing very small parts of a huge global network that directly impacts almost every aspect of our lives. They certainly don't seem to be able to make drastic changes to those networks, which are mainly owned by private corporate industry and become such complex systems that they largely run themselves. To paraphrase the filmmaker Adam Curtis, instead of electing visionary leaders, we are in fact just voting for middle managers in a complex global system that nobody fully controls. The result of this feels to me like a democratic vacuum. We have citizens that don't trust politicians because they feel this disconnect. They see from everyday reality that despite their claims, politicians can't affect change. They might not understand why, but there's this increasing sense that politicians and leaders have lost the ability to make fundamental changes to our economic and social realities. So we've ended up with a large body of mainstream voters that wants to kick against the status quo, that feels like the world isn't working for them, but maybe they're not sure why. They want change, but don't see politicians being able to deliver it. Until now, perhaps. Suddenly there are mainstream politicians that see this vacuum for what it is and see how it provides them with a political opportunity. But let me be clear, they don't see this as a political opportunity to try and affect change. In fact, most of them at best believe in accelerating process, deregulating, handing more power to networks. This is, to me, the true, what the true motivation behind the Brexit decision for, in the UK, for example, really was. No, for them, this is a political vacuum that would be filled with blame, with finger-pointing and scapegoating. It's an opportunity to make themselves look powerful by pandering to fears, by evoking nationalism, racism, and even fascism. So we have to decide what we want, I guess. Do we want the networks to run the world, or do we want to take back some control over our politics, our economies, our environment? Do we want politicians who understand how this all works and are honest with us about the political reality, or are happy to maintain the status quo, or do we want opportunists and extremists that will seize the political vacuum? Either way, I think we, and by we I mean everybody, need to understand these work networks as well as we can and find our recogni recognize our place within them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah I, I did just blame Trump on global supply chains. You I just, did. Yeah, there you go. Uh, you know, it's part of the thing. Yeah. Does anybody questions? Uh, yes? No? Huh? Well, I have a, a qu 
comment and question. It seems to me that there was quite a jump from the presentation to the conclusion. <laughs> uh, well, these networks are made for profit, no? That's the purpose. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean to focus on networks and to blame them in a way, I think it's misguided because it's all driven by goals such as profit, power, and all that. And we should look into that in connection to what you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, they're obviously there for profit, but these are, um, these are networks that are, that, that are modeling and shifting global economies. And when they model and shift global economies, they're modeling and shifting local economies. And that's having a direct impact on, on people's lives. I mean, one of the big reasons you've seen, a, I, I believe, the reason you've seen the, the rise of a mainstream far right in Europe and in the US this year is because people feel very threatened that, that their jobs have disappeared. They've seen 20, 30, 40 years of their jobs disappearing. You want to understand where those jobs go, you need to understand these networks. Right? You need to understand where they've gone. They've literally gone uh, to China, to India, to Brazil. Not that they shouldn't, and not that those economies shouldn't boom, but we, we need to understand, rather than blaming Obama or blaming liberals or, or whatever it is that the, that the rural far right is doing, the alt right is doing, um, or blaming regulation, they need to understand how the, how the global economy has shifted. I mean, like, um, I didn't, because I didn't have enough time and I didn't have the best of footage, because again, they wouldn't let us shoot. We went to a, a one, the world's biggest shipyard just outside of Shanghai. Production line where they build container ships and, and oil tankers. No, it's incredible. Um, jobs. There were mainly Chinese workers and some South Indian workers that had come over. That's, that's taken jobs directly from somewhere like Camden in New Jersey, which is uh, one of the poorest areas in America right now. It's taken jobs directly from, say, Glasgow in the UK, and lots of shipping uh, shipyards around the world. Um, and I'm not saying that shouldn't happen, and I'm not saying the global economy shouldn't shift to the east and the south. But if we're going to deal with it in the West and the North, then we need to understand how and why it's happening. But isn't it about uh, technology, who profits from technology? Because this acceleration leads to accelerated inequality. Very much so. Yeah. And so I, I think this is really the root cause of problems with the democracy we see all around the world. So, yeah, so I'd, I'd agree, yeah. So we have to focus exactly on this point. Yeah, yeah. So as we think about these global supply chains, there's increasing pressure to create different mechanisms of accountability across them. Uh, at the very least, let's just talk environmental accountability, right? The sludge that you show is deemed to be unacceptable to many of the Western recipients of these goods, and so there's pressure to do so. But at the same time, we're talking about tensions around nation states, very real aspects of corruption and, and regulation. How do you see viable mechanisms of accountability within these systems? Is it possible or is it completely a pipe dream? So uh, I, there was, we had a discussion about this on Twitter like last week sometime. And um, Frank Pasquale, who I'm sure you probably know, said he said the perfect thing to me about it. He said, Apparently, total su su surveillance is inevitable for everybody in the West, but impossible to implement for supply chains. And, and he's got a good point. We don't have, we don't seem to, we've put a huge amount of resources into con in surveillance capitalism, right? I mean, I could talk for 20 minutes about Pokemon right now. But, you know, like everything we do leaves this digital footprint, apparently. I mean, I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir a bit, I imagine, here talking about this. Uh, to you guys, but the, the idea that everything we do on social media, uh, every product we buy, Internet Things stuff, everything is tracked. Everything leaves a, a data footprint. Uh, big data knows all things about us, or at least minds us in as this huge, like, like mass of information. I can't imagine it being too hard. We're meant to be innovators, right? You know, uh, Silicon Valley is meant to be innovators. They've been very well at getting us to this point. I can't see it be too hard that we could have some kind of infrastructure put into place to, to watch human rights, labor rights, uh, environmental problems, pollution and stuff. Um, you know, I'm, I may be being oversimplistic, but I'm a journalist. 
I don't think there's a will. Yeah, exactly. There's no profit to be made out of it, right? And and that's the main problem. Like you know, like, like my colleague was saying, it's it's uh, it's this is a network that largely runs itself now, and it's it's got to the point where it's it's not self-aware, but it's very it doesn't need much management. But it's designed to be efficient, and that's it's that's all it's designed for. And we need to. I feel like we need to wrestle back some control of that, and into so to to just redirect it in some ways. I mean. It's a terrible science fiction analogy, but you know, we talk about Skynet and Terminator, and there's this fear that the machines are going to come alive and, and kill us all. I, I feel it's certain in a way that Skynet happened, but it's more interesting in selling us shoes made by Chinese child labor than it is killing us. Right? And we had some discussions. I, d I talked to Liam, actually, and this was the thing he, he came up with. There's, these networks are built for distributing wealth and material goods around the globe, but they're only doing it in one direction. And you know, he said it's easy to imagine something like a computer being assembled from components that are made from all over the globe, and thus giving wealth and employment opportunities to a larger sector of the world. So a lot of rare earth minerals are being mined. Not China's the, the, still the main producer, but Africa, African nations are, 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 are the emerging ones, and Australia to a lesser extent. That stuff's been mined in Asia, in Africa, sorry, by largely by Chinese in, investment. And then it's being shipped straight out of, of Africa on these supply chains and going to China. It's going to Shenzhen to be put into iPhones or anything, like anything. If you've got a magnet on, a, on your wallet, it's probably rare earth, right? Why not do that manufacturing in Africa? You know, why not do that in African nations? Why not do it in Australia? Why not create jobs for the local poor there? Um, what, it, the processing could be done there. The processing is being done there. Then some of the it doesn't even have to be a finished product. We've got a network that distributes uh, components extremely efficiently. Why don't we crowdsource manufacturing so we can identify areas of the world where there's a there's unemployment issues and and, and and base manufacturing there? It's very hard to talk about this stuff as as a Western white guy because I mean most people in this room I imagine have grown up without seeing this level of manufacturing. You know, my parents, my grandparents grew up in, in, in working class London and north of England, and they are used to this. I showed them this stuff, and they're like, yeah, I mean, this is what it was like when we were a kid. But for us, it's still very alien, and it's very easy to look at this stuff and kind of and be disapproving or shocked by it. Um, and I'm not, really, I'm not really campaigning for anything, but I'm not campaigning for this to stop. I'm just campaigning for it to be better and fairer and maybe more evenly distributed. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are about autonomy. I was having a discussion last night with uh, colleagues at the UN about access to data around evaluating and measuring development goals. Mm -hmm. And um, I made the claim, which is what I've experienced many times, that there's data out there, but there's a lot of gatekeepers and they don't allow you access to data. And so I think it would be lovely to, to further map and add transparency to the global supply chain like you're mentioning, but I'm curious if uh, supposed state autonomy would come into play? Because I think it's actually more than just, is there, there's, there's no will there. I think there is a will, it's just exactly the opposite will. So you're talking about autonomy in manufacturing specifically? Autonomy, or? well, it would, I think it would fall under the guise of state autonomy, right, like, okay. oh, you can monitor your own citizens, but you, we don't want to share information about our own citizens yeah. with other places because that deals with national security and autonomy. Yeah. And under that, there's this hidden level of what's actually happening yeah. with supply chains. So it's incredibly hard to get any firm statistics or data out of China. It's just in, it's impossible. And I, the first thing, I've got really good editors. The first thing when I came back and started writing this stuff for the BBC and, and for Vice, they were like, okay, you're making these claims, but you need to back them up with figures. And the reason I hadn't done that is because I couldn't find figures, right? So you see some of the numbers I said of like from 2009, that's like half a decade ago. Um, but they're the most recent figures that are, that are available. And I don't know in China an answer to what you're saying. Yeah, we, I, it, we need some transparency there. How that happens within the Chinese way of doing things is incredibly hard. They were not particularly open to discussing a lot of subjects with us on a on a face to face basis. Yeah. Well, I mean I would say neither are we, right? Like we yeah, true. It's true. Containers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. Yeah, there's stuff in those containers. The only stuff we knew about there was two types of materials we knew about on the container ship. We had a 
I was shown the manifest. For a start, it was kind of like, you're just going to show me the manifest like this? I was talking to the captain. He went, oh, yeah, here's the manifest. Bang. And it was a list. It was a printed out list of containers with the serial numbers of the containers on, which is the only thing that anyone knows about the containers. They've got like a QR code style barcode on them and a number. Um, and most of it was blank. But there were some that marked hazardous materials. And uh, if it's an explosive, it needs to be ma marked in there. And they were the detonators in car airbags. We had uh, some containers of those we were shipping somewhere. Uh, they were marked. And the other thing was the reefers. And the reefers, we know it's in the reefers just because for insurance, and it's only for insurance reasons, as far as I can tell, the human crew needs to make sure the reefers are working all the time. Because if you're... Uh, your container full of bananas or Ebola vaccine or something very important turns up and it's off, then obviously there's a big insurance claim to be had. So everything, going back to the efficiency side of thing, everything in the network is about being as efficient and, as, and, and avoiding legislation as possible and not transparency, unfortunately. And I'm not quite sure how we combat that. Yeah. My question is about working conditions and... Um I guess like compare, seeing those two different types of factories, one that's super automated and one that's like a craft. I mean, beyond the fact everything should have like a living wage and not be like moldy and stuff like that. Did you, having watched the two different factories, do you feel like there's like uh, value to the like Ruskin argument that like doing things by hand has a more, there can be like more pride in your labor or I don't know. Did you that? No, I, underst I, know, I understand the argument, I don't think it applies really in this, this, this sense. I'm, again, having to hand wave a little bit because I, 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 I was in China for three weeks. I'm hopefully going back later this year or next year to, to look at some other stuff. Um, but from what I've read and from talking to other people who've done research there, the vast majority of manufacturing you see is like that. It is that handmade or hands-on, rather, maybe we should say, no, let's call it handmade, because it is, right? It's handmade um, manufacturing in sweatshop-style production lines. China put out a report last year called 2025, which is about their next 10-year economic plan. The government issued it. And it said it'd be a huge push towards automation of labor. And um, this came out of the backdrop of the huge plummet that their, stock, that, uh, their markets had and the huge stock plummet. And that was caused by, uh, largely by rising cost of living in places like Shenzhen, right? You go to Shenzhen and uh, at night the, the factory workers are out around town, they're buying mobile phones, they're shopping in the Apple store, they're making for, for China a fairly good wage and you can see there's a, a middle class that's expanding fairly quickly. Shenzhen is atypical of cities in China. It's, there, there's a few large cities like that. Shanghai and Beijing are different altogether. There's not actually that much manufacturing there. There is on our level, but comparatively there isn't. Like I said, most manufacturing in China is not of electronics. We like to think of it as being of, of you know, iPhones and, and computers and stuff. It's of crap, for one of a better word. Well, it's everyday stuff. It's, you know, my socks, my trainers, uh, um, like these cups you know, like everything, your wallet, everything, right, is, is manufactured, trash bags, name it, the vast majority of those products are, are manufactured in China these days. Um, and that stuff, it doesn't make any economic sense to automate it at this point. The technology is not quite there, but what, like I was saying earlier, what it does is, these aren't huge factories that are making these, these products, they're lots of small factories. Instead of there being like a, a factory of 10,000 people in making TVs, there's a thousand factories with a hundred people in making socks or something, right? And um, transitioning, and there's small companies that are doing this, right? Transitioning all that over to automation would a, take a lot of investment that China doesn't actually have necessarily at the moment, or especially these small companies don't have. And B, it instantly brings in all issues of flexibility. Like, you know, these are factories that respond like that to changes in trend and demand. You know, if the trend for those socks with little toe holes comes, right, or something like, you know, if that suddenly becomes a big thing over here, or socks with Pokemons on suddenly becomes a, like a massive thing here, those, those factories overnight are able to flick to doing that. They just steal the designs from somewhere and start manufacturing them. Because there's no, 
changing or reprogramming or upgrading the technology involved in doing that. It's literally saying to someone, you're making Pokemon socks now instead of black socks. That's the only, the only change. And overnight, they can react like that. So I'm, I'm skeptical of claims that automation is going to hit China as hard as a lot of people are saying it is. I think it will in big brand factories. I think it will in Shenzhen. I've seen stuff about manufacturing, robotic manufacturing of Nike trainers even. But I don't think it's going to hit people that make umbrellas, the umbrella city. You know. That's the a million dollar question that I don't have an answer to. I, I, it was incredibly hard to talk to people there, which was the biggest tragedy of the trip for me. It was incredibly hard, A, to get to talk to people, and B, when you did get to talk to workers, to production line workers, they were incredibly shy and embarrassed. Uh, and that was the one part of the trip that was, that was very frustrating for me. And I think that kind of ethnographic work is n not the kind of ethnographic work that should be done, being done by a white man like me. It's ethnographic work that needs to be done uh, by Chinese researchers in China. That's not the work for me to do. I'm there to sh go and come back here and tell you about it, right? You know. Um, how happy people were? It was. I, don't, I, w I wouldn't say they were necessarily desperately unhappy. Uh, a lot of times, in some of the, the, the smaller factories, they were often watching TV shows and stuff on their phones. They were allowed to do that. The, l the smaller factories were less regulated than the larger factories. The larger factories had that kind of dystopian sci-fi feel where everybody had to queue up in line to leave and all this stuff. Um, and everyone wear uniforms. People didn't wear uniforms in the smaller, like in the Christmas, in the Christmas factory. But they were getting paid a lot less. And where they were living was horrible. I saw their dormitories. Compared to the dormitories at the, at the TV factory, the conditions were not nice. They weren't great at the TV factory, but they were better. They're modern. They're modern buildings. A lot of these are repurposed old social housing that's been used for dormitories and stuff. Um, I think, what, what, for me, because we buy these products, the supply chain is like a direct physical connection to me, to those Chinese workers, to factory workers. And I feel that that's what is unsettling for me. It's that, you know, my wallet or whatever is, is made by someone in a factory, and there's, I've seen this physical connection, like literally handing things to each other connection. And, and I, so it's part of a transaction, and I feel like I'm on the unfair side of the transaction. Does that make sense? Right? So I feel like these kids are coming straight out of a very basic education and then working in factories for like maybe 18 hours a day uh, just so I can get stuff for cheap. And whether, maybe they're happy doing that, but I, I feel like that's, there's an unfair power balance there and then they've not, they're not getting the agency and the, the, the choice of lifestyle that I'm getting that involves the products they're making right, a lot of the time. So, yeah, it's a very good question. It's the, it's the big question, and it's not one that I'm able to answer. So. I think we have time for one more question. Yep. Hello. Hey. Um, I am Chinese. So it's always interesting to hear a different perspective. Um, this, there is a, I'm always fascinated by the great fascination everyone seemed to have on China. Naturally, it's the biggest country in, you know, in Asia, one of the biggest in the world. So just if I could provide any insight to your frustration, everyone is frustrated <laughs> when you want to get information. But I think it's important for uh, researchers from all over the world to think about if you were a Chinese person coming to the United States and requesting to see any kind of manufacturing, I think you wouldn't get half of the information out either. And I think that's, that's, that's the part, that's the perspective a lot of people are missing because I think most people here would agree the United States or the UK even for that matter is not really as transparent as we think. And especially when you come to a manufacturing or coming to a nuclear plant or T-cell or these kind of, it could be easily seen as business intelligence. So I think that, you know, of course I understand there is the frustration. There is definitely a culture of ambivalence and nobody wanna be straight out about things because nobody wanna take responsibility, language is true, whatever. But I think there is also the other aspect that people sometimes forget when they go to China. You don't just go to a country and get information inside out because that's just, you wouldn't get it here either. Um, 
It's interesting to see that about Shenzhen. I went there many times, many years ago, a couple of times actually. You do see the change, like you said, that you don't see over here in New York, that you come back, you see changes, gentrification, Brooklyn, but it's not the same level as you mm. see in places like Shenzhen. And I do appreciate you, I think was really interesting, and I guess this is also posing as a question. As I can't remember who said this before, it's a very extreme statement they put forward, but they say there are two kinds of countries in the world. There's one kind of countries you know, that take the shit, and there is the other kinds of countries that really decide what to dump. And I think what's really interesting, and I guess my question for you also is from your perspective, you know, obviously I think it's very frustrating for a lot of Chinese also that the country is almost not doing anything regarding the regulation. Now, do you think the government or the local agency have more power over the private sectors in terms of regulating to do it better? Or do you think this should be, like where should the pressure come from? I mean, honestly, I think from everyone, what everyone said today, you know, consumers, we all as consumers, everyone here, probably most people have an iPhone. We all have a responsibility and stake in this. We're all consuming it, therefore there is the supply. But then there is the government, like you said, you know, who are probably losing grip day by day over these manufacturing regulations that matters. And then there is obviously the big net network and the cooperation. How do you see these three components interact to make things different, I guess, to actually exercise this pressure to make a fundamental change or maybe a slight change in, in how we get consumer goods from now on? That's, a, <laughs> that's an excellent question, and I don't know the answer to it. Um, there's a, like you say, there's, there's three major factors at play, and how they interact is, 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 is the first transparency we need, I think, is, is to really understand how these different factors interact. Um, I don't quite know how regulation works in China. Um, it's another, I could say, I'm, as the, this was two years ago, and I'm still doing research. Still trying to get to the bottom. I kind of did this the wrong way around in some ways. I went and I saw stuff, and then I had to come back and try and deep, um, unpack it and understand what was going on. I had two weeks' notice before I went on this trip. It was like, you know, like Liam, <laughs> do you want to come to China with us for three weeks? Yeah, okay. It was like that, literally. And, um, and I don't know the answers to what you're saying necessarily. And, and, and you're completely right about the transparency as well. It's not that easy to walk, walk into factories here. Um, it's easy for someone like me to walk into factories here. I can phone places up and say, I work for the BBC and blah, blah, blah. Can I come and have a look around your factory? And they will let me in. Um, one thing that was very interesting about factory visits was pride, is how proud people were of, of their businesses. And they should be, right, in, in some sense. And it's jarring coming from that Western perspective and, like I say, not growing up around manufacturing. It's jarring to work, walk into what looks to us like a sweatshop and the owner of it to be like beaming and say, look at my beautiful, my beautiful workers, you know. Um, and that's very much, that's very much a Western perspective. Because um, these people have gone through an economic miracle themselves, right? The owners of these factories have come from themselves, some of them being subsistence farmers, and now they, they, they you know, they're, they're manufacturing on a global scale. So there's a lot of conflicts there and a lot of contradictions, and I don't know necessarily the answer. Um, I think what I'm trying to say is, I want people to be aware of this stuff, and I want people to consider this stuff, and, um, and come up, hopefully, with realistic solutions to how, how people on, a, on an individual level can get involved. And, but I don't know what those, those are, unfortunately. Okay, um, so thank you again so much. This has been fantastic. Um, <laughs>